my just what 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 <laughs> okay, phew. Great. Thank you so much. So this is Pawtucket, Rhode Island. This is actually the, the, Wadding Mill fire, the, the fire at the Union Wadding Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island in 2010. And my hypothesis is that the combination of environmental policy, environmental archaeology, environmental history can help preserve a range of historic sites within cities and rural areas. Abandoned industrial buildings like the Union Wadding Mill dot the landscape across the United States. Combining the tools of environmental policy, environmental science, and archaeology offers the possibility to change the trajectories of sites and prevent fires like this one. This is actually one of the first five sites I was considering working on for the research that I'll be talking about across the course of today. And I've often wondered if I'd picked the Union Wadding Mill instead of Lebanon Mills, the building I eventually worked on, would the trajectory of this building have been very different? Probably would not have burned if somebody paid more attention to it. So my background, as Colin said, is in anthropological archaeology and environmental studies and sciences. I have taught courses in environmental science, environmental policy, and environmental social sciences, but today I'm going to be talking with you about my research at the intersection of archaeology and the environment. In an effort to diversify my experience with audience and with the different types of sites that are threatened, I have worked with three of the major types of environmental sites that might be of concern. These are by no means the only types of sites but they represent a good sampling of the range of issues and audiences one might encounter. From the perspective of preservation, the first, Lebanon Mills, is a completed project, at least for the next few decades. I will spend most time during, oh my goodness, you guys are not looking, okay, I did not advance, here we go. My apologies. You should have been looking at this lovely slide for quite a while now. Um, all right, you should have been looking at this beautiful slide in coastal Rhode Island. And um, the pressure of preservation, it's a completed project, at least for the next few decades. I will spend the most time during this presentation talking about Lebanon Mills, and we'll discuss the other two examples briefly. The second, Gail Myers Forest, represents the unique issues faced by student forest managers. So if you as students had to manage a forest and it had all this history and all this archeology, span what would you do? How would you manage it? And the third green farm in coastal Rhode Island harkens back to more immediate issues of preservation and what will happen to the site next. And if there's time, I might talk a little tiny bit about my current research, but I don't think there will be time. So probably won't talk about bioregional urbanism and city has changed too much. All right, all of the sites I'm going to be talking about are located in southern New England in the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. In 1902, at the newly opened Lebanon Mills in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, a young woman named Carrie Whitaker was working on a spooling machine rather like this one. And she was walking back and forth, back and forth, servicing her machine, replacing spools, tying in new threads, making sure everything ran smoothly as she did every day and had done since the mill had opened that September. But she didn't have a little spool, a little thread catcher like the woman in this picture has. And one day, some of the threads got away from her and tangled into her machine. And without thinking about it, she reached the first two fingers of her right hand into the machine where they were caught by the gears and promptly cut off. Carrie Whitaker's accident was the first recorded accident at the newly opened Lebanon Mill site, and indeed the only serious accident at the site for many years. And Carrie continued to work at the mill across her career. And I often use her story and the idea of, a, of, of her experience as a starting place to humanize the idea that this wasn't just an abstract building, but this is somewhere where people worked and cared about and had accidents as well as happy times. So Carrie Whitaker's story is a window into the world of Lebanon Mills. When I first began researching Carrie Whitaker's mill 
in the late 1990s, um, it was a, it's a six floor textile mill. You're looking at it halfway up a hillside. The mill is built into the hillside, so you're only seeing three floors. And the six floors, when I began my research, were mostly full of cardboard boxes, empty cardboard boxes. When you see a six floor building that's mostly full of cardboard boxes, you know you're dealing with a company that is in the process of going out of business because nobody fills that big of a building with empty boxes, not even people selling boxes. So I knew something was going on and the future of this mill was in question. And in fact, if you look in this picture, where you see the tape line in the parking, the string line in the parking lot is actually the edge of another building that had been taken down about the time I began my research. And there's in fact rubble fill to this day where this building had stood. So the future of this building was in question. And given the larger context of abandoned mills, this was a building that wasn't abandoned yet, but given this larger context of abandoned mills in New England, I knew it was in danger. And people, when I began my research, I was a young thing. So people often said to me, why would a young thing like you want to study an old textile mill? And my answer is, textile mills are not just part of our past. They are also part of our future. Future generations are going to have to make difficult decisions about what to do with them next. And that perhaps by combining these tools, we can make some of those decisions easier. So um, Lebanon Mills was of particular interest for a couple of reasons. First of all, I used to tell the story that Pawtucket mayor was always a guy, but there's actually been a woman in office in Pawtucket for a while. So every day when the Pawtucket city mayor sits down at her table at her desk with her cup of coffee and looks out her window, what does she see? She sees Lebanon Mills. So it's symbolically, visually in the heart of Pawtucket. You guys are not looking at the slide that shows that. So there you see City Hall immediately across from the Lebanon Mill site. The mill is also just upstream from the Slater Mill historic site, which is the site of one of the two earliest working textile mills in the United States. It's a national historic site. And today, Lebanon Mills is one of only two surviving mills immediately upstream of the Slater Mill historic site. Historically, in 1906, there were lots and lots of mills between the Slater Mill historic site. Let me see if there's a, yes, there is. Lots, lots, lots of mills between Lebanon Mills and the Slater Mill historic site. But today, because of abandonment and destruction of mills, Lebanon Mills is in the funny position of being the closest surviving mill to the Slater Mill historic site, preserving some of the sense of this dense industrial landscape that was once lining the banks of the Blackstone River in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island. So my research questions were, how has the Lebanon Mill site impacted the surrounding environment over time? And what is the future of the Lebanon mill site. The methods I used were the combined tools of environmental policy, anthropology, archaeology, and environmental history. I conducted archival research. I consulted government records. I spent a lot of time looking at maps of the building. And in particular, these are what are called Sanborn fire insurance maps. And they're really, really great any time you're trying to know about the history of a place. Because a fire insurance company like Sanborn or the mutual fire insurance company, if your building you're living in burned down and you have fire insurance, the insurance company wants to know exactly how much to pay you. They don't want to pay you a penny more than they have to because they're in the business of making money off fire insurance. So they keep very, very detailed records. What is the structure made of? What sort of processes are going on in there? Sometimes down to the level of how many machines are on a particular floor and where are they located. So if a fire starts, they know exactly where and when and what was going on and how much money they owe you. So they're wonderful resources for environmental historians. They're wonderful resources for archeologists. They're wonderful if you're just trying to figure out what your house was doing 100 years ago, because they have great, great detail on structures. I also use the tools of standing building archeology, span which is where you look at what's going on in a standing building. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Look at what's going on in a standing building and how you can interpret 
what happened from what's remained. So here you see a worn place on a floorboard next to a smooth, still polished place. This is where a woman like Carrie, the worn place on the floorboard is where a woman like Carrie Whitaker walked back and forth, back and forth as she serviced her machine until she wore the finish off her floorboards. And if we want to talk about modern policy and policy regimes, we could talk about OSHA, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, and some of the ways in which we can see that presence in that legislation starting to be manifest in industrial structures. And this is a line, you'll see them a lot in modern industrial buildings. OSHA is trying to channel the movement of heavy machinery through the factory to keep it with, away from workers and in safe places. But as soon as you start looking at these stripes, you realize something pretty funny. There's a lot of places where heavy machinery is rolling right over and ignoring those lines. So if we want to talk about making OSHA standards more effective, we need to talk about something perhaps more durable and effective than just paint lines on floors. You can learn a lot from standing building archaeology. I also took oral histories of local informants. This is my inter one of my subjects in 1998, Hank Leonard, showing me how to use the cardboard box building machine that was why the entire mill was full of cardboard boxes. It was something to do, something to do on a busy day, busy on a quiet day, you just make more cardboard boxes. And in 2007, Randy Warner, one of the folks who's involved with the present of Lebanon mills. So going back to my research questions, how has the Lebanon mill site impacted the surrounding environment over time? Land use in the area pre-1640s, this was seasonal fishing grounds for the Wampanoag Native Americans. There were a number of species of anadromous, which means seasonally migratory fish, who used to run along the Blackstone River. Alewife, salmon, shad, the damming of the river, dams like this one by Slater Mill, ended the annual fish runs by the early 1800s. And there's a lot of talk right now about taking these dams down and trying to build that fish runs back. And there's some local people saying, oh no, there were no fish runs here. There were never fish runs here. But if you look at the archeology span and you look at the history, these dams stopped them in the early 1800s. That doesn't mean they weren't there. So the land use from 1640 to 1800s is farming, series of farm families, Bucklands, the Smith, the Reeds, the impacts from farming, um, because the site, as I mentioned, the mill is built into a hillside, and we do have evidence that that hillside was cleared, there would have been some pollution during this time period from the clearing of the forest from, because it's at such a steep slope, soil nutrients, some nit little, little pulse of nitrogen in the water as that washed down in the first, the first spring storm or heavy summer storm into the Blackstone River, but not so serious. Um, the period from 1835 to 1901, the primary land use on site was residential. And this gentleman, Edward and his son, pardon me, Alan, yes, Edward Thayer and his son, Allenson Thayer, had a grand mansion. It was considered one of the most desirable residences in Pawtucket. It was the first place to get a telephone in the entire city. It was really, really the hip, one of the hip and happening places to be in the city of Pawtucket in this time period. And... So have you guys heard of the term NIMBY? Can anyone tell me what NIMBY stands for? N-I-M-B-Y, great, thank you. Yes, not in my backyard. Well, I'm here to tell you that NIMBY is historically and culturally situated because Edward Thayer and Allison Thayer's Grand Mill elsewhere in Rhode Island burned down and they had this huge settlement from the Mutual Fire Insurance Company. They had so much money because they had a really nice mill. They could have put their mill anywhere in the world they wanted. They could have put it elsewhere in Rhode Island. They could have put it far away. They could have put it in the American South close to the cotton fields where industry was going to be going over the course of the 20th century or even somewhere else in the global south where industry went later in the 20th century. But where did they choose to put it with this huge settlement? They chose to put it in their backyard and they built their six floor textile mill immediately behind down the hill from their grand mansion. They had no perception of their mill as polluting or dangerous or something they wanted as far away as possible. If we went to many of the captains and lions and owners of industry today and said, would you like to live, have the mill in your backyard? They would say, no, it's risky, it's dangerous. I've moved it as far away from myself as I possibly can. So risk and perception of risk are very much culturally, historically situated and based on how much you know and how much it's been studied. So 
The building was built in their backyard in 1900, fronting the river and the Blackstone River. Um, when the new mill opened its doors, it had six stories, over 100 workers, and over 100 knitting machines. And um, from 1901 to 1938, the company produced knit goods, predominantly underwear, on site. And when I began my research, my dissertation advisor said, hey, my thesis advisor then said, hey, um, you should look for lovely ornamental features on the building and try to interpret what they're for. So I was really excited when I got there. And I thought, oh, great, these two lovely towers, oh, they're, they're pretty. What decorative purpose do they serve? And I actually went into the building and learned these are the towers through which all of the human and industrial waste went directly untreated out big arches at the bottom or big pipes at the bottom into the Blackstone River. They're toilet towers. It's where all the hundred workers went to the bathroom during the day and where all the waste from all the machines and all the industrial processes went out into the river. Bleach, dye, dirt from washings, dirts and soaps and oils from washing and treating the textiles and all the waste from a hundred workers for the entire day from the time you could see at night to the time you could, time you could see in the morning to the time you couldn't see at night, all going untreated out the base of those towers directly into the Blackstone River. So. Certainly wouldn't have wanted to swim in the river at that time period if I were the, the owners of this factory or anybody else in the area, but people did. Um, so the next major change in how the building is impacting the environment comes in the 1950s when they put in a sewer, which leads to the waste no longer going directly untreated into the, into the river, but downstream to the Bucklands Point wastewater treatment facility, where there's still really more or less just barely treating it before it goes in. At this time period, they're doing what's called primary waste, whoops, I'm on computer. Primary wastewater treatments in which they are simply removing the solids and the greases from solids, objects, grit from the waste that's going, from the water that's going, going to go into Narragansett Bay. And things get a lot worse during this time period for the mill and the mill's impacts because the mill is purchased by Henry Jablecki, who founds J&K Sales Company, which is a costume jewelry manufacturer. And they, they manufacture the sorts of costume jewelry you might have worn or purchased from a little, little quarter machine at the grocery store when you were little. So very inexpensive costume jewelry with a lot of rather unpleasant processes for the environment. Processes on site included casting, soldering, electroplating, painting, and packaging the jewelry. And of those electroplating, these bubbling, bubbling vats, bubbling tanks, are probably the most environmentally destructive. Included in those vats, in order to get the outer coaters, coatings to stick on the jewelry, which is mostly made of cheaper metals, um, you would have needed cyanide, chromium, cadmium, nickel, gold and silver itself, lead, mercury, all sorts of things you wouldn't want to drink. And if you were any other sort of organism, you wouldn't want to be in water that was drinking either. And of course, the Clean Water Act comes along in 1972. The federal water, more formally called the Federal Water Pollution Control Act of 1972. And the Clean Water Act has its, its provisions, quote, Eliminate discharges into navigable waters. And certainly you can take a boat, despite those dams, down the Blackstone River. And the, the Clean Water Act also specified that they would make navigable waters fishable and swimmable by 1985. And some of you should be scratching your heads going, oh my goodness, the Mystic River still isn't fishable and swimmable. So the idea behind the Clean Water Act is it's what's called an aspiration statute, which is something the lawmakers hoped would happen, and maybe you hope to embarrass people into happening someday. So I used to say the Charles River, because you couldn't imagine 40 years ago, 20 years ago, the idea that the Charles River would be fishable and swimmable. But there are people swimming in the Charles now. They've opened up a couple of times in the recent summers. They've opened up swim, swim in, in the Charles Water swimming areas. So it's an aspiration statute, something that you hope will happen. And sometimes in the case of a river like the Charles, it does come to pass, but not by 1985. So an aspiration statute, something you hope would happen. And all of this is relevant for Clean Water Act, for um, this story, because the Bucklands Point Wastewater Treatment Facility, where all the waste from Lebanon Mill and all the other jewelry manufacturers in that part of Pawtucket is going, is also subject to the Clean Water Act. And by this time, they've put in what's called 
uh, secondary treatment, which is where you have not only settling and removal of hard objects, but you've got organic matter, you've got um, bacteria that are actually in the tank trying to break down some of the nutrients. So you're not sending so much nitrogen and so much other nutrients into the bay, which is really, really bad for fish, and bad for shellfish and other sorts of industries. People are eating, you know, trying to eat things out of the Narragansett Bay still at this time period. Um, but the problem is, of course, bacteria, every time Jane K. Sales Company and all of the other upstream users empty their go on vacation every summer in June, July, August, all of these plant managers go on vacation and they just dump these vats containing mercury, cyanide, cadmium, cropium, nickel, lead down the sewer. And the, the, the stuff just travels in the sewer, gets to the, those treatment plants where the poor bacteria are trying really, really hard to remove all the nutrients from the water, kills all the bacteria. So then, there's nothing being removed from the wastewater stream and the poor Bucklands Point wastewater treatment system gets out of compliance with the, with the Clean Water Act and gets in big trouble, gets lawsuits and all sorts of things repeatedly. And after a while, they're like, okay, we're not making this work. People are not, we have to change our upstream users. So they mandate that all of their upstream users put in wastewater treatment systems so they won't keep getting out of compliance with the Clean Water Act. And this turned out to be great, ironically, for the mill because it turns out they were selling, they were throwing down the drain marketable amounts of gold and silver. Great for the company. It's also great for the mill because it has an effect of condensing in the last years in which the mill was in operation, all of the toxic waste in the building, all of the cadmium, mercury, chromium, nickel, lead, silver, gold, are all getting condensed into two places in the building. So you know during those time periods where all, where all the hazards are, what are the areas that are likely to have contaminants, it makes it much easier to allow the building to go on to other uses. And it turns out they can sell this sludge and make a profit. We're not gonna talk about the environmental impacts of what happens when you take the gold out of the sludge and what happens with all the remaining toxins. It's not pretty, but it's not happening on site. So strictly don't have to deal with it, but it's worth thinking about. All right, so if we look at the larger pattern of Lebanon mills, we can see a period of increasing impacts that were driven by settlement and industrialization, followed rather a long time later by a period of decreasing impacts that are driven by the creation of the public sewer, the removing of waste off-site, relocation of waste off-site. The federal system of legislation, the Clean Water Act, that's forcing the Bucklands Point Wastewater Treatment Facility to clean up their act. Changing technology that we can put in the system that removes most of that, that catches the sludge, and removes most of the toxins. And the market forces that are slowly driving J&K sales out of business. So the question becomes, what then was the future of J&K sales company? The Jablecki family, when I began my research, were very, very skeptical. They had just seen a building taken down right next to them. They didn't think anybody would want their building when they went out of business. But as I did my research, as I uncovered stories like Harry Whitaker's, their perspective began to change on their building. And they eventually used my report, my initial report, to interest a historical-minded developer in the property. So I'm here to tell you don't let anyone tell you that undergraduate thesis research cannot make a difference. This was my original undergraduate honors thesis, and this was actually what changed the trajectory of Lebanon Mills. Because they had this research, they had this idea that actually there was something of interest to this building, it made them reconsider the options and not just say, oh, we'll tear it down when we're done. Let's think about how we can reuse this and find some folks who might be interested. So very much, changing the possibility. And what began as my first under, began as my undergraduate honors thesis is also turning out to be a component of my first book. And in my book, I'm looking at how to combine the tools of environmental history and industrial archeology, span as well as environmental policy and science to change the future of other industrial sites. So I'm not always so happy about the story at Lebanon Mills. It became kind of the classic story for industrial redevelopment, which is an artist's live and work community, riverfront lofts. Um, the building was unusually uncontaminated, so it was really easy to convert into lofts. The building was also cut off from its historic, um, the, the, when the new highway between Boston and New York and Providence went in through, through Pawtucket, 
um, it cuts Lebanon mills off from histor its historic worker housing base. All of these mills were originally built to be live and work, where workers lived in the immediate area and walked to work. But the highway cut the, this particular mill off from its housing base. So we didn't have the same concerns that you have at a lot of other mills that become artist housing. We didn't have the same concerns for gentrification because the highway, they were completely different tax, tax zones entirely because of the presence of the highway. And there was no easy way to re-knit that. Um, so I didn't have to worry about gentrification the way you do at a lot of places. But I'm really spending a lot of time thinking about what are other stories we can tell. These mills were often workplaces for live and work communities. How can we get them back to being workplaces? How can we find new forms of industry? Think of things like this is a textile building built with reinforced floors to hold big vats of water. Okay, what are some new industries that might use big vats of water like aquaponics that we could put into some of these places rather than that would support local, create jobs for local workers rather than just the one note story of um, artist lofts. So, try to involve my classes. So here are my Wheaton College students reading and mapping the landscape around Lebanon Mills on a class field trip. Given the larger picture of brownfield redevelopment in the United States, brownfields are buildings like Lebanon Mills, lightly contaminated industrial structures. And there's a lot of lightly contaminated industrial structures out there. Everything from your neighborhood dry cleaner when the mom and pop company owning it goes out of business through to big, big buildings like this is part of the Baker Chocolate Factory in downtown Boston. And my book, Not Your Average Run of the Mill, Combining Industrial Archaeology and Environmental History to Shape the Future of Factory Sites, is trying to address these buildings. And there are brownfields at campus that we're actually possibly all going to be involved with. So this is Tufts um, is involved. Possibly the Tufts Institute of the Environment may be consulting with the Wynn Brownfields Reuse, Develop Reuse Project in Everett, Massachusetts. So there's absolutely brownfields not too far from campus that there's possibly for student involvement in. All right, I'm going to talk very quickly about two other types of sites. My next research project, Miel Myers Forest, represents a very different set of challenges. To begin with, Yale Myers Forest itself is not currently threatened. What are threatened are the environmental history and, and archaeology resources within the forest boundaries. So it's the head forest of the Yale School Forest System. It's seven, there's seven forests in the system. It's 7,000 acres in northeastern Connecticut. The history of the land, um, and I should say very quickly, why do we care about forest history? Well, one of the things that's been proposed to make money for this particular site is to sell carbon credits to offset global climate emissions. But environmental scientists have recently discovered that forest history affects how much carbon can be stored in forest soils. Sites that were not plowed or minimally plowed are much better at storing soil, storing carbon soil in their soils than sites that have been disrupted by having a plow go through them. It kind of makes sense. You know, if you disrupt things, you disrupt things. It's harder to move forward with soil processes. So forest history matters if we wanted to create carbon credits like Elmire's forest, if we want to get the most bang for our buck for carbon offsets. Um, the history of this landscape is one of forest clearances. Um, you see a relatively populated landscape with lots of people, but you're also seeing a bunch of things that say SM, SM, saw, that stands for sawmill. This is the height of forest clearances, about 1869, 1870s in, in the area. And what that is telling you is even though there's a fair number of farms dotting this area, you're also seeing some big areas between the farms and a lot of sawmills. And those two things combined tell you there's probably a lot of lumber activity going on. A lot of people engaging in lumber, but the farms go belly up, the railroad goes somewhere else, all the dairy production goes somewhere else, and a lot of the farms get abandoned um, and eventually are aggregated by an early graduate of the School of Forestry and so, uh, donated back to Yale when um, land tax right, systems changed in the 1930s. So in the forest today, there's a lot of stuff going on that the students Part of our project has been to help the student managers be much more aware of. There's historical and archaeological resources, things that are standing like this um, part of an old sawmill with my colleague Philip Marshall, the Elf Myers Forest historian standing there. There's artifacts, things you can take with you, stone walls, buildings. You couldn't take that away with its meaning intact. 
And there's a lot you can do in research from farm landscapes. If you're trying to understand, hey, was this site plowed? One thing to look very quickly to look for, if you're going for a walk in the woods anywhere here in New England, in an area with a lot of stones, and you want to know, gosh, what can I tell really quickly about landscape history? Here's a two-second takeaway. If you see a thin wall with mostly a few type of stones versus a thick wall with lots of different types of stones, if you're a farmer and you're plowing a field, you run into stones really, really often. You run into big stones, you run into little stones, and every time you run into them, you nick your plow blade, and that means you have to resharpen your plow blade. So you don't want to do that too often. So every time you run into a stone, you stop. You take the time to drag the stone to the edge of your field, and you either drop it there or you build a wall. So when you see a wall that has lots of big stones and lots of little stones, all kind of either stuck together loosely or carefully built because someone had the time to go through and build it into a nice looking wall, then you know you're looking at a, at a field that was plowed because someone dragged all those stones out of the field. If you see a wall, it's just one stone thick with mostly big stones and a few little stones holding them in place, you're probably looking at a field that was used to pasture animals for sheep or cows because you didn't really want to take the time to drag huge quantities of stone there. You just wanted to build a wall with what you could quickly. So it's a very easy way to tell when you're going for a walk in the woods if you encounter a thin wall versus a thick wall. Was this a plowed field or was this a field that was maybe used for herding sheep on their way to market or on their way to shearing? So there's a lot you can tell from researching farm landscapes. You can look at stone walls. You can look at historic records. You can look at leases and deeds, probate inventories, things someone owned when they died, letters and diaries, maps, and agricultural censuses. You can also look at the current vegetation. You can look at what trees are there today. And here's my students from Wheaton looking at what trees are there today in the Wheaton woods. And that can tell you both in the tree canopy, the overstory, a lot about land use history, but it turns out you can also learn a lot from what's going on at ground level from the understory. That, for example, wintergreen doesn't come back quickly to sites that have been plowed. So if you're seeing a site that's got a lot of wintergreen and you know it's wintergreen and not false wintergreen, then you're looking at somewhere that wasn't plowed. You're looking at somewhere that would be great for carbon storage credits, for example, that may be storing a lot more carbon in the soil. And plus, hey, wintergreen makes great tea. A great thing. You can also use archaeology. You can use aerial photographs. We've done lots of research at Yale Myers Forest over time, including student research, and we can certainly talk about trying to find comparative sites in the area. Um, finally, I'm going to talk very, very quickly about Green Farm, where I was the co-director for a number of years. Green Farm is in coastal Rhode Island, um, and you could ask, it, ask the, town, the question, why Green Farm? So first of all, the site is threatened. It's historically significant. It's the site of a 1642, one of the earliest houses in the town. It's also got beautiful standing 1690 buildings. And it's ecologically significant. It's a 100-acre um, like tract today, originally a 600-acre tract with important local watersheds and forests in the area. And it's substantially threatened by development. There's a lot of houses going in in the area. It's also less than five minutes from an expanding regional airport. And hey, it's a 100-acre strip running inland from the water. What a great place to bulldoze the standing 1690 house, put in a runway right there. It would be a great place to have planes taking off and landing from that airport that's less than five minutes away. So it's substantially threatened. And the family. The people who own the property are in their 80s, a man and a woman in their 80s, and they've been very, very involved with local politics. Nothing is going to happen to the property in their lifetime, but their children live all over the world and are not involved with local pro pro politics at all. And there's a real question when the children inherit the property, will the local government respect the right of the family to do what they've been doing in protecting this property all this time? Or in light of the Kelo versus New London Supreme Court decision, which argues that a town can take by eminent domain properties that are not serving the highest economic good of the town. Will the town simply claim this and say, hey, we could make a lot more money off a bunch of McMansions paying taxes. We could make even more money off an air another runway for our airport. Or will they let the family continue to preserve the property in paying agri zoned agricultural, so paying agricultural taxes, which are very, very little to the town. 
So our research at Green Farm has been around this, documenting the ecological significance, the historical significance, and the archaeological significance excavation going on, what's going on on this property. I see I'm very close to out of time, so I won't spend too much time showing you guys. We spent a lot of time asking the question, how has the landscape changed over time? And we've had some real surprises. So the landowner asked us to look at this lovely, looks like a lovely ornamental popular in the 1860s bog garden. You know, let's put in some water lilies and things. But we put in this excavation unit right next to it, thinking, oh, you know, we'll find it's a bog garden. She was like, I can't grow any of the flowers I'm supposed to grow in the bog garden. Not a bog garden. It turns out 1600s illegal iron smelting. Her ancestors in early 1600s, back when Britain mandated that all iron that was found in the United States had to be sent raw back to, to England, had discovered local bog iron and were smelting it into nails and not very high quality nails because it's pretty crappy bog iron. But um, what she thought was a, bog, was a bog garden was in fact the old factory site, was the layers of clay that were laid down to prevent the water that is frequently rising out this area. It's famous for spontaneous springs. And her ancestors had laid down layers and layers and layers, this is the blowpipes, by the way, from one of the bellows for iron smelting, layers and layers of clay to try to keep water from rising up into their iron smelting operations. So totally not an 1860s bog garden. In fact, early evidence of early, very interesting evidence of early colonial industry. And we've tried very hard, this is some of my archeology span students, and then these are the grandchildren of the current landowners, get local, get the grandchildren involved, get them excited. I always say, I don't let anybody dig barefoot, but grandchildren got an exception, um, to get them involved and excited about the history and the future of their landscape because they're then maybe they'll have the opportunity to make some decisions about what's going to happen at this site next, and maybe they won't. All right, future green farm is unclear. So, oops, let's see. Summary in next step, oops, we can talk about tools like the transfer of development rights, which I do not have time to talk about. I'm just going to flip through here. Um, the tools of archeology span and environmental history can be appropriately combined to advocate for the preservation of historic places. These are applicable to different types of sites and they're applicable to sites from different time periods. And they can help us to understand the past in order to plan for the future. And in the last two minutes we have here, in a small group, please get together and discuss 